Okay, you're good to go. Okay, good morning, everybody. Uh, so, uh, welcome to day three. So, today we have uh, David Sampson from the University of Surrey. Uh, David, we know in our community mostly for OCT, uh, but uh, he is uh, has become the Pro Vice Chancellor at uh, Surrey because of his expertise in knowledge exchange and commercialization and involvement in startup companies, which I know many of you will be interested in. Um, people will also know that uh, David spent a lot of time at the University of Western Australia in Perth, where he led a large group uh, working on uh, OCT and elastography and so on. Uh, he's a fellow of all the major societies in our field, including SBIE, OSA and IEEE. And I would like to not waste any more time in handing over to David, where he will introduce uh, and recap maybe on some of the work that he has presented, and then we'll go to questions. So over to you, David. Thank you very much, Martin. Um, can everyone see and hear me? You guys give me the thumbs up. Yes. <laughs> great, great to uh, great to be with you all. Um, uh, I know you're out there somewhere. Uh, um, I'm uh, sitting in my office. Uh, in a in a rather empty building uh, here in Guildford, um, we've uh, been uh, since lockdown. We've been working from home, and um, uh, this is a building that normally holds probably uh, uh, two or three hundred people, and there's probably ten people in it. Um, so strange times, um, but um, that's given me more time to think about um, uh, summer school lectures and record the lectures that that I did for you. So. I'll just quickly in the first five minutes recap on those lectures and then uh, open it up for your questions. But, um, have the, the next slide, please. Or can I control that myself? Don't think so. You could advance it for me. Thank you. And next click. Um, so in the first, so basically I divided it up into six mini lectures. Um, in the first, uh, I introduced this paradigm of, of medical imaging versus optical microscopy uh, and, uh, and introduced um, uh, uh, enough tissue optics to enable you to appreciate and understand that. So it's a sort of tissue, the whistle stop tissue optics from the perspective of OCT. And we spoke a little bit about uh, um, uh, in, in that lecture um, about uh, the broader field and about where we stood in terms of our capacity to image individual cells anywhere in the human body. Uh, so that was the first lecture. Uh, so that's the scene setter. Um, in the second lecture, the green uh, print you can see there, um, the, um, uh, we got stuck into OCT. And we immediately looked at uh, the resolutions that could be achieved uh, and the limits on those resolutions, both uh, both axial and transverse, um, and set, set some sort of fundamental um, ultimate limitations about where you might get to. And then in the third lecture, we got into the technical detail of um, what has become the mainstream of the field, Fourier domain OCT. Uh, and we started to touch on the thorny topics of speckle uh, and then one which isn't touched on much, which is image artifacts and how um, uh, you can be caught out by seeing things that aren't really there um, in an artifactual sense. And both of those, speckle and image artifacts, create problems and headaches, as well as opportunities. And so the fourth lecture was about how to capitalise on one of the opportunities created by speckle, and that is its dynamic behaviour which enables us to discriminate between static and moving objects in a in a um, in a highly turbid medium. Uh, and that has been put to work in OCT and geography, uh, which we went into um, in, in some detail. And then the fifth lecture, um, we went into another extension of OCT, uh, which characterizes polarization properties of tissue, um, primarily by refringence and the optic axis um, uh, of the birefringence and uh, gave some examples of that. And then finally, uh, a third um, extension uh, amongst all of the various extensions we might consider 
and that is um, OCT elastography, or as we call it, OCE, uh, which is uh, probing the mechanical properties of tissue. So that's the six lectures in a nutshell. Um, then, if you recall, um, perhaps you could just uh, put up all of that uh, slide for me, just uh, hit all the clicks. Um, then, uh, yeah, so, so this is the, the first lecture in slightly more detail. Um, and um, uh, I think uh, we we finished by looking at those uh, fundamental and technical challenges um, and indicating that progress has been made, but there remain substantial challenges in order for us to get to the point where we can actually do true medical optical microscopy anywhere in the body, um, which is good because that will keep us all doing research for a good number of years. So next slide, please. So, and in lecture two, as I said, we covered some of the fundamentals. We really looked, uh, when it comes to fundamentals, we looked at the effects, the ultimate effects of absorption uh, and, and scattering as limiting factors and described how hard it is to actually get to one micron resolution. Um, we went through some of the nuts and bolts of the basic principles as well in time domain versus Fourier domain. Of course, time domain hardly used these days, but an important starting point from a pedagogic uh, standpoint. Okay, next slide. And uh, as I said, we covered those three uh, sets of technical details, different perspectives. Um, speckle is a subject which, um, you know, uh, leading lights of our discipline, such as Joseph Goodman, have spent a good deal of their careers studying. It's a rich topic. Um, we just scratched the surface. Uh, and then we also dealt with the technical details of Fourier domain OCT and as well as um, some surprising artifacts, I think, which catch us all by surprise on occasions. Next slide, please. Now, when we uh, described angiography, we set, set it up uh, in terms of uh, it being one of a suite of so-called parametric methods, parametric imaging methods, uh, which in essence, uh, capture a parameter which somehow varies with depth um, uh, by collapsing three-dimensional information down into two-dimensional information to map that parameter. And that really um, in many ways applies to angiography, which are always maximum intensity projections over a, a, an axial distance. Um, polarization sensitive OCT is often cumulative retardance across a depth and elastography often requires uh, an estimation of the change in uh, displacement versus displacement over some axial distance. Um, but the one we focused on was, was angiography, which goes beyond being uh, a contrast enhancement and into being actually something which uh, provides physiological information in its own right and uh, really is becoming um, a, a key companion to, um, to, to standard uh, intensity imaging in the retina especially. Next slide, please. Uh, and then we spend a lecture on polarization sensitive OCT, uh, which really is a masterclass uh, in its own right. It's complex and it is challenging, uh, but it is rich with opportunity. And I think uh, it's a classic example of where something has been stalled because it's difficult. Uh, and uh, once we've got, but that difficulty is able to be overcome and we are overcoming it. And that then, that then leads us, uh, you know, we've, we've crossed the mountain pass and we've arrived in Shangri-La and we can just see at the edge of the jungle, the riches that lay ahead. Um, so um, look out for PSOCT in the future. And then the final slide, please. And then elastography uh, is now um, uh, actually has quite a following. There's been a conference created at Photonics West. Um, it's, it's a, it has really emerged from, um, a long, again, a long gestation, uh, very similar to PSOCT in a way, and that is that it was very difficult, required a whole lot of different advances, um, initially stimulated, I think, really by the ability to do volumetric imaging, so to do three-dimensional imaging. Uh, and then, um, uh, you know, once that had been overcome, then then a raft of different uh, developments have occurred. I focused on the ones that uh, um, I had been working on, but um, it goes still further. 
Um, but at this introductory level, I hope I've given you a flavour for it. So that's the six lectures. Um, let's uh, throw it open to uh, to any questions and um, that, that you may have, and I'll see if I can answer them. Okay, David, uh, thank you so much for that and, and for your original videos. Um, uh, so we, we do have some questions and thank you to all the um, submitters who gave their location. Uh, one of the things we miss from online is is the sort of networking and the color of knowing where people are from and, and uh, the excitement of uh, yeah different accents and so on. So Hampus from Lund uh, wants to know um, uh, about ophthalmology and this has been the biggest area in OCT so far. Where do you think OCT is moving and what are the areas that will see new OCT solutions in the future? Well, wow. yeah, so so I think if you remember in the first lecture, there was a, um, a slide uh, which uh, described the outputs of OCT and uh, there's more than 80,000 um, outputs and uh, some, more than 50,000 of them came from ophthalmology. So, so in a sense, there is a, um, a whole nother world of OCT, which is beyond the general research area in which is, um, clinic, is, is populated by clinical ophthalmologists. And so, whereas, you know, um, the, the community that I'm associated with goes off to Photonics West to actually um, uh, get together and, and we go to the OCT subconference there and it has usually three or 400 people in a room, um, some uh, 10,000 or so people go off, or maybe it might even be 20,000, go off to AVO, which is a, a broad ophthalmology conference held in Florida every year. Uh, and there is a big OCT sub-community there. But a lot of those people are actually doing um, clinical development. So they're, so they're doing research, but it's clinical research. So it's taking the existing tool and trying to understand how you can use it in clinical problems. And that is going to continue. So ophthalmology is going to continue to be a really uh, important part of, of OCT research going forwards. Um, and that is moving into, um, I think angiography is, is, is a hot topic. Um, it continues to uh, develop um, an understanding of how the vascular system interacts with the nervous system uh, in the eye and, uh, and development of that will, will continue to be important. The, the next big area that we always talk about is cardiology. Now, um, cardiology is on a long time frame, even though um, OCT and cardiology has been, been now worked on for quite a good considerable period of time, at least, uh, at least 15 years um, in the commercial arena, it's still not absolutely clear that it has a long term place in cardiovascular medicine. And, and that doesn't really reflect on other than um, it's, it's a complex space and there's a lot to do. But there is a lot of activity in that area and there's been a huge amount of investment in that area. So um, I'm quite confident that it will uh, find a home there. But again, it's still subject of research. Um, and then you go out into uh, so many other applications um, and many of them uh, are still uh, sort of clawing their way into existence. And I think they will piece by piece. Um, you know, there is a lot of work on uh, intraoperative um, imaging, um, even even uh, in, within ophthalmology, um, there are um, uh, intraoperative systems um, in which imaging combines with therapy, which combines with surgical procedures to be able to to provide additional information. Um, dentistry is uh, continually rich with new OCT ideas, uh, dermatology, um, and uh, I mean it, the list goes on and on, but. How many of those have actually gotten traction on the scale of ophthalmology and cardiology? Well, no, they haven't. They're, they're not anywhere near at that level. And what does that come down to? Well, at the end of the day, it comes down to the fact that it's rather challenging to image through opaque tissue, to develop the endoscopic systems, the needle-based systems, the other imaging systems that, that are required to get you to where you need to be are very challenging, very technically challenging. And then when you get to those tissues, if they are truly highly scattering, then being able to see things at the cellular scale um, uh, represent ongoing challenge. Um, so, um, you know, I think, uh, as I said, that, that, so that in one sense is a frustration, another sense of joy, because it gives us lots of things to work on to try to push 
um, the field forwards. Okay, great. Um, so, uh, a truly Chatarshi at Irvine, um, who's obviously up very late. Uh, can you talk about how OCT resolution would improve for cleared tissues? For example, although the tissue may appear more transparent, uh, what would that mean? Even, sorry, I have to move down. Uh, less uh, contrast, so worse resolution. Uh, yeah, look, the, the question of contrast is a really interesting one because with OCT, it's a double-edged sword. So on the one hand, if you don't have any scattering contrast, the sample is completely transparent, um, then you don't see any signal. But let's be careful about what we mean by that because in order to uh, see a structure in OCT, you need to have, um, you need to have scattering but scattering alone is not enough. If the scattering is uniform, then you don't see any change. You need change in the scattering. So you need to change in the gradient of the refractive index within that sample. And then you're able to actually perceive a structure. Um, I showed in my elastography lecture um, a really interesting video of, a, of, a, um, of an artifact, uh, of, a, of a, essentially of a, um, of a phantom in which hard blocks had been embedded but each, the phantom itself had uh, infralipid scatterer in it, or titanium dioxide scatterer, and so did the hard blocks, and they had the same. And so in OCT, you couldn't actually see the difference between the hard blocks and the rest. But in elastography, when you started pressing on it, the mechanical response was completely different. So you had a mechanical contrast, but you had no optical contrast. But you had lots of scattering, so you had lots of signal, but you couldn't actually see anything. Now, when you introduce a clearing agent, then what you're doing is you're removing that, um, that, that um, some of that scattering. Uh, now, is that helping you? Uh, well, it depends. It depends. It depends on what's limiting you. I mean, if you are truly limited by multiple scattering, you've got too much scattering, then clearing will definitely help because you just once you have multiple scattering, you have a, a signal, but you don't have any image information. Um, so, um, and at that point, optical clearing could definitely be of assistance. So I guess the thing is, it's not an automatic, um, um, you know, a winner. You have to understand what your target is. So you have to have a more sophisticated understanding of the scattering properties of the thing that you're trying to image. Um, and the other thing I'd say is that um, if you look uh, at something like the cornea, you know, it's one of the most uh, transparent uh, things that uh, we possess, um, actually, it's, uh, it's still surprising how much scattering you do actually get from the cornea. You, do, you know, we, we've just done a study on the cornea with uh, polarization sensitive OCT, and uh, you get, uh, you know, you, you still get strikingly significant amounts of scattering. Uh, it is a very sensitive technique, OCT. It picks out um, ve with very high levels of discrimination the photons that have been singly scattered. Uh, so you don't need many. Yeah, so it's really great at getting rid of all of those um, scattered photons usually. Um, so uh, Acholi also says that he, he loved your cartoons um, that you used to explain your points and uh, asks, oh, he works on me scattering systems. So he was wondering if it would be at all possible to share your Raleigh me scattering slide from lecture one. So maybe you can think about that. Um, Absolutely, get in touch. Send me an email and I'll be happy to share it as long as I okay. figure out a, a suitably fat pipe because it's quite a few bits. Very good. Um, uh, David McMahon. Uh, over and over again myself, so I know what you, what you mean. <laughs> David McMahon in lecture one, uh, you, you mentioned that uh, ND YAG laser has higher MPE than higher wavelength lasers and by using it at higher powers, it could provide more light deeper. By how much can we increase the light intensity compared to the shorter wavelength lasers? And uh, what are the medical implications if we go to higher powers? Um, are you sure that's me? I'm not sure that question uh, rings any bells with, with me. Um, oh. Coming from lecture one? Yeah, that, that sounds more like a, a photoacoustic 
question. And uh, of course, it, it in theory could apply to any. I, I think if, if I throw out a very hand-waving answer to this, uh, it, it refers to the safety standards and the amount of light you're allowed to put into tissue, I, I think is about four times more at, at 1064 than it is at, at, let's say, 600 nanometers, right? So, um, so you do get that extra uh, benefit that you can put in uh, extra light. So even if people say that uh, at 700 nanometers, light penetrates deeper, uh, people usually stop there, but from a practical point of view and building a system and a commercial system or a system that goes into the clinic, uh, if you can use four times more light, then uh, you ought to uh, include that in your uh, in in your um, estimation. And basically, the penetration depth is comparable at 730 and 1064, but you can put four times more light in at 1064. I think that that's what that's getting at. So, um, let, so uh, let me add to that though, just in the in the context of OCT and wavelength and power, um, it's uh, I, you know because I think people might be interested, and I didn't cover it, I don't think in the lectures particularly. I mean, people have done OCT out to 1.7 microns. I mean, they've done it beyond that as well as sort of proofs of principle. I think um, Adrian Poggiano actually did it in the um, in the million for red, um, not that long ago. I think at 3.3.5 microns or something. Um, but uh, at 1.7 microns, actually, the performance is not that different to 1.3 microns, uh, and it can be helpful in um, in certain um, in certain non aqueous um, um, samples like teeth, um, so hydroxyapatite, uh, because you get less scattering uh, and uh, and you get more penetration. Um, but at the end of the day, uh, the bottom line is none of us ever see too many high quality uh, images that go beyond the millimeter in depth. And if we get to a millimeter, we're all pretty much um, you know, over the moon. Um, but when it comes to how much power we use, um, I think for applications, I mean, for the eye, it's obviously very strictly controlled and, uh, and there's a huge amount of data and it's well understood. For many other applications, we tend to just pump in the power and uh, and hope for the best. And we obviously stay within, um, you know, genuine safety limits. But a lot of those safety limits are not that well established. And when we're tightly focusing a beam down onto tissue uh, with of the order of tens of milliwatts of power, we are getting into the range where photo damage can take place. Um, and certainly uh, that's a big issue for multi-photon microscopy where high power is, is almost essential. And you know there has been some interesting studies on showing uh, you know how melanin preferentially absorbs strongly and then creates damage um, at, at levels of power which are in the sort of I guess 30, 40 milliwatt uh, average power range. Um, so it's definitely something that needs to be taken into consideration. On the other hand, if you illuminate most tissues with less than a milliwatt, it's very hard to get good quality images. So we, you, we uh, in in my experience in our group, we've typically been in the one to ten milliwatt range, uh, the, the sort of power levels at the sample, uh, in order to get really good quality images. I'll stop okay. there. Unsolicited answer. <laughs> so Anant in Augsburg in Germany wants to know: Does tissue structure have an influence on the penetration depth in OCT? Oh, well, I think the answer is definitely yes. Um, you know, uh, you see, uh, I showed in uh, the, in lecture three of the artifacts um, what happens when you have uh, refractive um, inclusions. But the thing that really uh, shines through is vasculature. You know, if you hit a vessel, then you don't really see anything beneath it. And, um, and so you just get a shadow from that vessel thereafter. So, um, so I think vasculature is often um, under recognized as a confounder in imaging. Um, people don't realize it's always there. Then, of course, some others are going after it deliberately to image it. But um, if you just see darkness and scattering, uh, it, it can be uh, profound. Uh, so, yes, the het heterogeneity of what you're looking at is is very important. Um, that's also true in uh, in the retina, where um, often uh, lateral resolution is poor, and people are much more interested in axial uh, layer thicknesses. Um, but but people have moved towards attempting to actually image 
um, uh, the uh, the rods and cones and you know the, the lateral structure of the eye with adaptive optics and uh, and high resolution and other me and various methods and what they find there is that um, the rods and cones themselves can be um, can act as optical waveguides and so they begin to uh, grab the light and then you know funnel it in certain ways so the answer to that question is absolutely yes Okay, great. And of course, the layers make a make a huge difference. So um, Meng Li and Lund uh, wants to know, is it possible to replace the laser with an LED and OCT and achieve coherent light in a similar resolution? And he has a couple of other questions. Maybe start with that. Yeah, sure. So so when it comes to light sources, uh, the the in, the overarching important aspect is that the light has uh, many optical frequencies and then beyond that it can therefore come from anywhere so it can come from an incandescent filament it can come from a fluorescent tube it can come from a dye it can come from an led it can come from anything at all um, if it's spatially incoherent so it's a spatially distributed source uh, then that sets additional challenges in order to be able to observe interference uh, but even with a spatially uh, incoherent source, you can still do very well. I mean, um, one of the best OCT systems that I've ever seen uh, uh, comes from um, from um, from the Paris group and of uh, Claude de Bocquerat, and uh, and they do use uh, an incandescent filament uh, as the source. And over the years, they've uh, adjusted that and done various things, moved on to LEDs. But but the quality of images they're able to generate are truly fantastic. Now, of course, at the same time, you can use a mode lock laser um, because it also has a large uh, frequency range. If you have a femtosecond mode lock laser, you have several hundred nanometers up to several hundred nanometers of bandwidth if, the, if you're down below 10 femtoseconds. Um, it, a super continuum source, uh, which uh, you know is, is somewhere between a uh, an ultra bright LED and, and a laser, uh, also can be used. So very, very wide range of light sources can be used. Of course, what is typically used are superluminescent diodes in most commercial systems because they're bright and they're relatively inexpensive. Right, but um, but also but an LED, a regular off-the-shelf LED, are there issues with spatial coherence and, and those kind of things? Yeah. yeah, no, so it is difficult to use an LED. It's difficult to get sufficient power. Um, so uh, on, on the samples, so it's, it's challenging, but it's doable. Uh, the uh, the original uh, Isis Optronics system used um, LEDs. I think it used five or six 1300 nanometer 90 microwatt LEDs and got fantastic images um, and was commercially available. Great. Uh, the second question was, can optical coherence tomography or retinal photography harm vision? such as perform too many OCT scans within a year. Oh, so I think the question is if you have a cumulative, is there some cumulative effect? I don't think there's any evidence for cumulative dosage. Um, you know, that, that if you stay within the maximum power exposure limits uh, for any given imaging session, then there's no evidence that, uh, that, that um, you would accumulate any form of damage. Uh, now, you know, does that track to to an extreme um i'm not sure so in other words if you image continuously for a year i don't know what would happen i think you probably would suffer for, for some health damage through the mental effects of being uh, confined <laughs> to an imaging chair yeah and having that puff uh, fired at your eye um yeah so if we can go to slide 10 of lecture one maybe anand can put that up um in the absorption spectra at At kizari wants to know uh, the data of protein is shown for a small window compared to water. Is that due to practical limitations? Um, why haven't we uh, Why haven't we seen protein across that whole spectrum? That's a really good question. Um, I guess uh, it uh, is relatively low given its concentration. Uh, so, you know, it, protein only accounts for maybe 15, 20 percent at most of tissue. Uh, and so uh, it's it's a relatively, uh, by the time you get into the visible, it's a relatively minor constituent. Um, 
So if, yes, if everything was made of protein, then uh, having that spectral information through there would be more important. So I don't think it's that important, but I don't know why it's actually uh, cut off in the visible. It's certainly cut off in the UV because of the challenge of getting below about 200 nanometers in, um, in, in measuring the spectrum. Right, and, and getting deeper enough into tissue where those proteins would be, I guess, is it is is a problem. Probably it's, it's as simple as uh, whoever made those measurements, the system they had just had that bandwidth and that's that's it really, I guess. Uh, yeah, I can't. I mean, I haven't seen a very wide band spectrum of protein, I have to say. But but, um, uh, you know, there are many versions of this plot and uh, there are many ways to plot it. Um, I will look out for it and if yeah. I find it, I'll let you know. You could have a look. Bob Alfano, I know, has done uh, work where he's given uh, more detailed spectra than I see from other people. So maybe have a look at Robert Alfano from, I think, City University in New York. So um, have a look at that. Um, a truly from Irvin um, says that you discussed various parametric methods in lectures three to six. Could you talk about if there have been any contrast enhancing agents that have been developed? either masks or chemicals designed to enhance the contrast of living or excised tissues? Uh, well, yeah, I mean, um, so certainly Steve Bopart has used magnetic nanoparticles to try to enhance contrast and tried to actually magnetically wiggle them um, to cause the dynamic effects. Have I still got you? Yeah, I've still got everyone. Um, uh, and let's see, um, air bubbles have been used. So the same sort of contrast agent that is used for ultrasound. These are micro micro bubbles uh, have also been explored for OCT. Um, the I mean, the, the issue is that you need it's, it's a challenge to to enhance the scattering uh, whilst not destroying the image information. So it comes back to this balance of clearing on the one hand, wanting to clear some parts of the structure, but wanting to enhance the the uh, the contrast with other parts of the structure. I mean, it is, it's a, it's a tantalizing um, uh, question about whether you can optimize uh, in vivo imaging with some form of clearing agent. And when the first work came out from um, from uh, uh, Vargas and Welch back in um, Gee whiz, that was the late 90s. Uh, it was super exciting and, and uh, Valerie Tuchin and Ricky Wang started doing work in this area. And, and you know, I mean, e even I did work on uh, clearing in the mid 2000s, but for multi-photon microscopy. Um, you know, I think it's, it's proven to be uh, complex, hard graft, and, and uh, the, the problem of actually um, dealing with a living thing uh, is is adds a, a huge layer of complexity to it. Now, of course, what's happened in the meantime is that people have developed clearing agents for uh, biological tissue that's dead um, uh, that are exquisite. You would have seen this uh, expansion microscopy where uh, they've actually might been able to make things transparent and then uh, magnified them to improve resolution. Um, you've seen um, a, a vast array of recipes for clearing brains to enable whole brains to be able to be imaged. So there's been massive development in the sort of poisonous end of the of the discipline, but not so much in the in vivo end of the discipline. But of course, um, in vivo optical agents are very challenging. But but don't think nothing's going on. Um, actually, quietly in the background, people have been working on fluorescent agents that can be uh, imaged in vivo in humans um, and be making considerable strides. And so, uh, su you know, such agents could be developed for OCT. It is coming and you know, I think it's very exciting actually what's been going on in fluorescence. Is the fluorescence in humans work um, agents that already exist and are used in humans or are you talking about new agents? Yeah, I think it's a combination of both. Um, there are new agents actually being developed and given approval, ethical approval for inhuman studies, um, and some of them are in the pipeline for FDA approval. So it's uh, it, it's uh, 
it, it's it's quietly evolving. Uh, you know, the, that's great to hear because usually you you hear, oh, this is going to take decades to get into humans. But but uh, okay, uh, Julian Mafes in Politecnico di Milano uh, wants to know how close was you, uh, the relation with clinicians during your studies, the so burns, eye, breast. Yeah, close, I guess. That, well, that's super super critical. Um, you've got to actually form uh, a multidisciplinary team and uh, you've got to work closely with these people and you've got to work on relationships uh, and you've got to within your own team you need all of the different skills uh, from people who can um, uh, design instruments and write software to drive them and do mechanical design and do optical design and fabricate the whole system but once you've got the whole system if you don't have the right skill set to apply it in the clinic to work effectively with the clinician not to tick off the uh, the nurse who's, uh, um, you know, to, to get to, to shake hands uh, to the anaesthetist um, to make sure that uh, your instrument is not in not the anymore. <laughs> yeah, no shaking hands anymore. Sh um, elbows with the anaesthetist. Yes, um, right. Yeah, but certainly to to make sure that they all feel that they're part of the the team and the, and that they're you're, you're working together and and that personal contact, which I guess is going to become more difficult now but um uh you know if we ever get out of this situation again that 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 really is very important and and uh, in fact brian pogue yesterday talked about a meeting at least once a week or twice a week if that's not possible with the clinicians and really having them as part of the the team not not just sending them an email when you're done sort of thing yeah right um well, in theory that would work but in practice it just never seems to work right um, I'd say another really important aspect, though, is that um, you have to be careful about leading your clinician. You know, you're working on a challenge. You're working on a problem. It's not your problem. It's their problem. They are the ones who've identified it. You must make sure that you don't solve the wrong problem, that you actually do solve a clinically meaningful uh, situation. And that's not always uh, what seems obvious to you. Uh, and you probably don't want to just rely on a single clinician. You always want to cross check these things to think to see that um, there is some sense of consensus. I mean, if you ask 20 clinicians the same question, you will get um, maybe not 20 different answers. You probably get 10 different answers. But but hopefully you will find that there is some um, some sense of agreement and you have to be careful about that because, you know, you can invest a lot of time and energy in working towards what turns out to be a solution that no one's that interested in. But you won't really find it out until you actually get to the point of of trying to commercialize it where you start trying to enlist clinicians uh, who want to actually try it out and uh, you, know, you, you don't want to leave it that late because life is too short yeah thank you for that uh, robert in london um, would love to hear more about the potential tissue engineering applications of optical coherence tomography elastography yeah i i think um the tissue engineering uh, applications for OCT are, um, are right. You know, I think there's there's a general um, lack of well uh, effective methods for characterizing uh, tissues on that length scale. So in the scale that sits between a single cell uh, and a whole organ, uh, and you know, a lot of tissue engineering is is working in that space. It's um, you know, organoids, it's uh, clumps of tissue, it's scaffolds with, um, you know, with matrix and, uh, and hundreds to thousands of cells. Uh, and OCT is perfect for that. And in fact, I'm seeking to get some projects going here in the UK in that area. Um, but again, it, it, what you tend to find is the people doing the tissue engineering are not working hand in glove with the people developing the optical diagnostics. Uh, and so it's um, it's a matter of uh, matchmaking and finding that uh, that good match. Okay, Ashwini at Linkshipping um, says many thanks for the engaging lectures. Many people have said that, so I'm just skipping that, David. I don't want your head to get too big. Um, in terms of the axial resolution, how far uh, can we go with the depth resolve OCT relative to conventional OCT? Um, I think uh, axial resolution, uh, I think two microns is a reasonable target uh, for, um, for practical imaging. 
Um, I think if you try to go beyond two microns, it gets really tough. Um, I think we can probably get in the sort of two to five range um, in many practical systems. And I think that's absolutely critical. I don't think we as a community realize how much we stand to gain if we can routinely get into that resolution regime. Uh, of course, it does depend on the problem you're trying to solve because in going to that resolution, you have to sacrifice field of view. And if you can't see enough of your sample, you have to figure out a way around that. So one of the things that we don't do very well in OCT is any sense of zoom. So, you know, if you actually sit with a pathologist and watch them look at a, a, a histology, they will be zooming in and out and they'll be, you know, they'll be covering um, single cell out to, um, you know, a centimetre of tissue. <coughs> be looking within a single cell. Now, we can't do that readily with a single image, um, but we haven't focused much on being able to create zooming systems. Um, but I think that's an area that that, um, that does need work. Uh, yeah, so context is, is important, obviously, in clinical imaging, like where that cell is on the... Absolutely. Um, yeah, and, the uh, and, and where uh, the parametric methods get to, um, is, is a good question. So um, some of them, um, uh, you know, when, when we measure parametric attenuation, then you, you, you need, um, you know, you need 20 uh, resolution uh, lengths at least to be able to estimate the slope of the curve. Um, and so, you know, 20 times two is 40 um, and 20 times 10 is 200. And so that, you know, that sets your resolution scale. Now there, but there, having said that, Oh, there's a very nice method developed um, in Johannes de Boer's group, which actually, by making certain assumptions, does not uh, take the same approach to uh, estimating attenuation versus depth. Um, so, you know, it's, it's again, it's an interesting topic for further research. Um, with polarization sensitive OCT, we've managed to get that down to uh, about 15 microns in terms of axial resolution. So it's pretty close to the native resolution, but uh, it's not the native resolution. <coughs> and um, do you want to comment on optical coherence microscopy or have you already included that? In your... Yeah, I sort of I've blurred the two together. I mean, I think, you know, if you want to look at the taxonomy of what should be called optical coherence tomography, what should be called an extended depth of field or depth of focus, um, what should be called optical coherence microscopy, what should be called full field optical, uh, you know, it, it becomes quite messy um, and I'm not sure there's a huge amount to be gained by um, just rigorously applying a taxonomy. Um, having said that, thinking about how these imaging systems work and what the fundamental underlying issues are with um, optimising the imaging performance, that's very interesting and that's highly worthwhile. And it's interesting to watch the full field techniques still coming back every time you think that they're not really going to cut the mustard, they come back and um, demonstrate some interesting new developments. Okay, in this depth resolved process while obtaining retardance, on what assumption those initial conditions were selected in order to develop a differential data along with uh, along an optical axis in that local region? Well, look, the principle is fairly straightforward. The principle is that you assess the polarization properties at a given reference point, and then you look at a thin slice, and you you look at the, the you essentially look at the differential retardance across that thin slice, and thus convert that to a known polarization state at the uh, output. So you know the polarization state at the input, you know the polarization state at the output. Um, so then you can. <coughs> process again and with the next slice and you systematically differentiate that cumulative curve as you work your way through the sample. So it's, it's um, it sounds simple, but there are a lot of complexities in practice. I mean, the, the complexities I didn't go into because I do think that is uh, beyond where most of you need to know at this point in time, but um, it, is a, it is a rich topic and there is as much complexity in the instrument itself as there is in the sample, um, because there are all sorts of strange polarization effects that take place in the instrument. And you need to take those into account as well. Uh, and particularly when you use optical fiber. And I would have actually, I probably should have included a couple of slides on the polarization properties of optical fibers because they underpin all of this. And, and they are, 
um, you know, the, the simple fact is that a rather small length of optical fiber makes a rather large change on the Poincare sphere to your polarization state. Okay, uh, would it account for topographic inhomogeneities? I guess that's referring back to retardance. Um, so what's interesting about uh, polarization con based contrast is that again, it's not automatically the same as scattering based contrast because it is essentially generated by sub wavelength scatterers. Uh, and so it's the, you know, it's the collagen fibrils, which you can't image an individual collagen fibril. Um, they can be from uh, tens of nanometers and in bundles up to, uh, you know, a few, maybe a few microns. Um, and so often we're not able to resolve anything, um, but we see the effects of that. And then, of course, you need to remember that if we took uh, two uh, nanometer scale fibrils and we line them up next to each other, then we would measure a net by refringence. Um, but if we took two and we crossed them with respect to one another, that by refringence would cancel out. And so, um, and again, we need to think about the orientation of the optical beam when we're measuring that. But um, uh, so, so, so the polarization mechanism is probing um, substructures that we're not necessarily getting to with with scattering, uh, but of course scattering is probing also pro probing or it, you know, is probing sub wavelength and sub resolution uh, contrast, um, but it's not the same contrast. Okay, Anant in Augsburg wants to know in endoscopy, although its uh, first target application. Uh, OCT hasn't found strong foothold because of lack of consensus on the benefit. I would like to know your perspectives on what exactly is missing from the technical point of view that needs to be done. I, I guess the, the clinical end is also very important from the point of view benefit. Yeah. Oh, I, I think the guys at Nine Point Medical would probably disagree with you because they're um, they've been developing OCT for Barrett's esophagus and they actually have a um, a reimbursement code in the United States, uh, and they're also developing it for um, biliary duct for bile cancer, a bile duct cancer. And um, I'm not quite sure how that's going, but but um, I agree with you, your general point. I mean, for me, one of the sobering uh, lessons of, of being in this field has been that um, high quality technical solutions don't necessarily end up being commercially successful. And I'll give you two quick examples. One is one is endoscopic, and this was um, a confocal, micro, uh, confocal microendoscope that was developed by, uh, in Australia, in fact, so I knew the guys that developed it really well. They developed it in Melbourne. Um, this was OptiScan, uh, and they were eventually bought by Pentax, uh, and Pentax was bought by Hoya. And uh, after having this utterly spectacular product in which you could see uh, all of the structures in the gastrointestinal tract, and you could, you could really see all the individual crypts, so all the little holes in your gastrointestinal tract with little flowers, structures around them, vasculature in and around it. You, you, it was just exquisite level imaging, um, but the company shut the product down and it didn't go anywhere. Um, and that, I found that, um, you know, and, and they'd done a lot of work. Uh, so, but they decided that there wasn't, uh, there was an insufficient business case. Um, and I think the other company that uh, generated a beautiful product was Lucid, uh, who developed a uh, skin cancer imaging product, uh, again based on confocal microscopy. And uh, they, uh, you know, they went on for like ten years. I saw that I saw a very early version of that product in in 1995 when I visited the Wellman Labs. Uh, Milind Rajajaksha was a postdoc, and he had just developed this uh, with a, a very simple setup, a near dimming laser, 40 milliwatts on the skin. Uh, created fantastic images. Ten years later, I uh, more than ten years later, I saw a talk at Photonics West given by the CEO of Lucid, describing uh, how what a what a tale of woe the whole commercialization had been, and how they ultimately hadn't been successful. And again, it was you know it left me thinking, goodness, what do you need to do to be successful? And the answer is that having a technical solution is only part of being commercially successful. And uh, you you need to make sure you're solving the right problem, and that you actually have a business model that can support the solution to that problem. And uh, those are sometimes missing, 
uh, and sometimes uh, the you know the technical uh, aspects need to stay sitting to one side, waiting for the right opportunity. Um, but I, I would hope that some of these, you know, having cracked the technical problem, we can turn it into a practical solution. And I'm pretty confident if anyone can do it, Nine Point can. So I'm watching them closely. Yeah, that that, that uh, this, this sounds great. So in in lecture two and three, uh, Maria Pilar. Urizar in Spain wants to know, um, so you presented a huge number of publications in OCT and its applications in OCT. It's mainly focused on Fourier domain OCT, or is there an investigation still being done on time domain OCT? In the Fourier domain field, is there more spectral domain or more swept source investigation? Right, so there's there's actually not much time domain OCT left, except for some instances of experimental work on full field. Um, I don't think there's much. Uh, there, there might be some legacy commercial systems out there in ophthalmology, um, but there wouldn't be many now uh, because there was a real explosion in commercial instruments uh, when um, it was realised that the Fourier domain uh, systems weren't patented and so once they emerged and it was realized that they weren't patent protected there was a, that led to a flowering of, of uh, companies producing instruments which is an interesting case study in its own right on the the suppression that patents can um, you know can affect on an industry um, so um, but uh, when it comes to free domain um, how much is swept source and how much is is um, uh, is spectral domain? How much is spectrometer based? That's a really good question. I, I don't have a, a. I mean, my in, my instinct would be it's not that far. It's not that different from 50/50. I mean, I think there's a lot of both systems. Um, you know, the spectrometers are now quite mature, and the, and they're OEM products, so you can buy them from a range of manufacturers. Uh, swept sources, likewise. Are, are, um, um, are available from multiple vendors and, and in fact using multiple technologies. Um, I guess I haven't, I'm, I'm wondering about the um, the um, surface emitting, um, uh, the, the, the Vixel light sources, the vertical cavity surface emitting um, lasers. Um, they seem to have been slow in coming. The electrically pumped versions of those seem to have been slow in coming, which suggests that there's not huge demand um but um but yeah overall i was my instincts tell me it would be um a, a significant proportion of both yeah so that your patent point is is quite important and i guess for the younger researchers maybe that deserves a bit more discussion so i suppose patents are really important uh where you've made a big investment over 10 years and and uh, you need to recoup that and you need to encourage people to do that research and and uh, with the promise that they will have some time to to recruit it, but but you're quite correct in you know if there is a big enough market, um, people will do it anyway, right? They'll they'll jump in and they'll start uh, making things. So so there is a balance between you know whether people have to invest a lot of extra effort. Um, in terms of the 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 uh, split, I suppose, between time domains, uh, spectral domain and, and uh, swept source, that, that's evolved over time. Of course, time domain had it all to itself for a decade or more, right? M mostly with Zeiss from a commercial point of view uh, or entirely with Zeiss, I suppose. And, and then in about 2003, there were some seminal papers that said, oh, you get all this um, extra uh, fast imaging for free, basically, because you're pushing the noise out of out of the detector and spreading it around. Um, and uh, yeah, so spectral domain sort of took off then. And then, then, then I think, am I right in saying that um, uh, that the swept source came a little later, maybe five or uh, six years later than that? Uh, but they're they're probably 50-50 by now. Yeah, no, you're right. The, the commercial side of swept source came much later. But interestingly, the first paper that I have in my archive on um, swept source was uh, from 1997 by nice. Eric Swanson and uh, Steve Chin, and uh, when Eric was still at the Lincoln Labs. And so it was pretty early days. Of course, it was quite slow, but it was very wide band because at the time they'd been developing swept source 
systems for telecommunications, for, for probing wavelength division multiplex optical communication systems. And uh, they were, again, Eric was in that field, in the optical communications field, and they were just borrowing uh, and reapplying to OCT, which is a classic model for um, advances in science. I actually think Joe Schmidt did a lot of that himself, um, demonstrated the power of actually having a broader scientific knowledge, understanding allied fields, and being able to borrow and reapply. So, you know, Joe Smith did uh, optical elastography first in 1998, um, uh, but he knew all about ultrasound elastography, which was already a 10 year old field at that time. Uh, but the rest of us didn't. The rest of us are going, oh, wow, what's this? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Amazing new stuff. So, Kai Nyhaus in Galway wants to know about Brillouin microscopy. It allows detection of mechanical properties by frequency shifting the reflected light, the Brillouin uh, Stokes. Uh, can we comment on the sensitivity for detecting biomechanical properties? Can it detect changes of cell intracellular pressure? Right. So I will now pretend to be an expert on everything. Uh, so I'm not <laughs> an expert on Brillouin microscopy, and there are some really, um, you know, it's a, it's a sub community that's um, uh, quite large now. And um, our good colleague, uh, Giuliano Scarcelli, would be one of the leaders. I'd recommend you look at his work. And recently, he's been working with a colleague of ours, Kira Larin, who is an OCT guy, and they've been combining the two. But um, in essence, what you're looking at with uh, the Brillouin shift is you are probing um, the, um, the, the, uh, the bulk modulus of the, um, actually, it's the longitudinal modulus. So uh, es essentially, you're trying. The, the the object is is unable to change its dimensions in sufficiently short time frame to be able to um, to be able to maintain um, uh, co you know, conserved volume, uh, because these things are, are phonons that are happening on the nanosecond time scale. So you're probing on the na actually sub nanosecond time scale phonons that, that have a lifetime of microseconds. So these things are traveling over incredibly short um, distances, but um, you're, you're able to uh, characterize their local environment and you're able to do it with microscopic resolution, but it's very challenging because the Brillouin shift uh, is very close to the Rayleigh line, very close to the line itself. So you need a very narrow band laser, you need a very high res um, discrimination in your spectrometer, very similar to what you need in uh, Raman spectroscopy, um, except that it's it's very, very close. So, so it, actually, a lot of the techniques to develop the instrumentation in brain microscopy are borrowed from astronomy. Same sorts of methods that are used to see planets in the vicinity of suns um, it can be used to enhance the discrimination in the Brillouin work. Now, Brillouin microscopy is uh, relatively recent um, when it comes to biological tissue, but it actually has a long history when it comes to probing liquids as, as a method in chemistry. Um, and the original instrumentation dates back to um, back to the 80s. Uh, in fact, I think even before, I think Sander Cox's work was in the 70s. Um, so, uh, but I find it absolutely fascinating because it doesn't contact, you're not contacting, you're probing um, so, so I consider it as an elastography method in which the excitation is intrinsic. So, um, you know, it, it's the for OCT that would be the equivalent of looking at pulsatile excitation, for example. You know, the tissue, the fact that your heart is beating and thus your tissue is experiencing a force, um, and you are able to then use that rather than apply an external agent to create that excitation. Uh, so, it's a it's a fascinating field. Um, there's been um, a, a lot of work done on it, and um, it, you know, I think it's an interesting companion to OCT. Great. Thank you, David. Uh, we've just passed 10 a.m., so I think we, we better give you a break. And how about we come back in um, at 10.30 a.m. UK Irish time, uh, and we continue from there. So thank you so much uh, for that. Um, really many interesting questions. So keep your questions coming and we will try to address them in the next session. So thanks to everybody. Go have a cup of tea or maybe dinner, depending on where you are in the world. Um, and we will see you soon. Thank you. Bye.
Okay, and we're back. And uh, let's see, David, are you ready to, for some more questions? Almost. Okay, so I'm going to read a question here. Um, in the case of contrast enhanced OCT, what are the desirable absorption and scattering properties for contrast agents? Agent. Does it depend on the central wavelength of the system? And if yes, could you talk about these properties comparing, for example, 900 and 1300? nanometer OCT systems. OK, so I can't see you guys. What's the screen meant to be doing? Can you see me now? Uh, yeah, now I can. Yeah. Great. So can you see me? Am I in the right? Yes, the I, I can see you and hear you very well. Mm -hmm. OK, excellent. So so can you recap on that question again for me? Uh, 900 and 1300 nanometer yeah, uh, so in the case of contrast enhanced OCT, what are the desirable properties of absorption and scattering and the contrast agents? Does it depend on the center wavelength of the OCT system? And if yes, please comment on 900 and Yeah, well, well I mean, l let me come back to the, the core point, and that is that um, uh, in general, we often find ourselves in a situation where we don't have enough contrast with the contrast that we get from scattering alone. And um, there, there's, a, there's, I guess, three ways you can think of going. One is to actually improve the resolution. Often we don't have sufficient contrast because we're averaging over um, uh, too many substructures that we can't resolve those substructures and therefore we just see a uniform average value. Um, the second way of proceeding is to try to introduce some form of contrast agent or combination of clearing and contrast. Uh, and the third way of going is to consider some extension of OCT which uh, performs parametric imaging. And so I guess I've been working on resolution enhancement and parametric imaging, looking at different parameters, attenuation, uh, polarization, elast elastography, and geography. That middle piece of looking at contrast agents is something which I think um, there have been excursions into, preliminary work done on, um, but it's challenging, and I don't think anybody's really generated results that have caused the community to really sit up and take notice. So it remains a, a sort of an, a, um, a, uh, an unresolved opportunity, I guess. Now, when it comes to the difference between different wavelengths, um, yeah, there are um, practical differences, um, but you need to explore in exactly what you're talking about in context. Obviously, if you're talking about fluorescent agents, it's quite hard to get fluorophores um, at uh, 1300 nanometers. If you're talking about um, uh, absorption properties, then you know um, the the, uh, the the water absorption is starting to rise at 1300 nanometers again. Um, so that you know the, there are certainly have to take into account the different um, absorption properties of of what you're dealing with. Okay, and and I guess that water absorption could also change the resolution of the system because it you know changes the spectrum, right? Oh, that's very, very valid point. I mean, the uh, the uh, sweet spot for um, imaging is around the 1000 nanometers from that perspective. Um, you know, it's actually the dispersion zero of, of water is also around that value, about 1050. Um, and uh, so there are, are good reasons to, to go to that. If you go to 1300, it's exceptionally difficult to get one micron resolution, as I showed uh, in, the, in the curves in my lecture. Uh, and that's uh, largely because of absorption. So the absorption then uh, simply uh, distorts your spectrum quite considerably and gives you a uh, narrowing um, once you get into more than about 500 microns of, of tissue. Okay, Abby in Iran wants to know, can we use OCT as a biosensor? Well, OCT um, is being used as a as a biosensor. I guess it depends what you mean in terms of specifics. Um, can it detect uh, selected biological agents? Uh, well, it would like like many optical methods to detect uh, biological agents. There needs to be a transducer 
uh, a biotransducer between the optical imaging system and the uh, and the agent itself. Um, you know, when you're talking about uh, plasmon resonance sensors, for example, surface plasmon resonance, uh, then these things are essentially measuring refractive index. Um, and you need a functional la layer to convert that refractive index change into uh, something which is specific to the agent you're looking for. Measuring refractive index changes with OCT is, is uh, also highly viable and, and, um, and something which can be done. But again, it, it needs that functional element to turn it into um, a specific biosensor. I don't know, Martin, can you think of a specific biosensor that's a, or specific sensing uh, angle that um, OCT is covering? Uh, good question. I guess you can also view it from the point of view of biomarker and, and you could talk about things like vessel density or um, these kind of things as, as biomarkers. Yep. Um, Comes you know, we, we also forget that, you know, where there is no scattering, uh, you have a void and, and that's actually a valid results in a, you know, uh, that means usually that there's just water there or there is some pure uh, liquid, possibly air too, of course. Um, that's and, the, and we image lymphatics. Uh, lymphatics are imaged through absence of scattering. Um, but uh, speaking of your biomarker point, uh, fingerprints, I think that's a, a, a right. very interesting angle that you yourself have, have um, investigated to some extent. So. All right. Uh, do, do the guys have uh, slide 12 from lecture two? There's a question on that I can come to in a moment. Yeah, it looks like uh, Aaron is putting that up. So the question from Asa in uh, University of Twente, I think. Uh, in the 3D representation of OCT data, what do the darker areas refer to? OK, that's almost what we were talking about, I guess. So, so that's a, a logarithmic uh, intensity scale. So the bright regions represent higher scattering, the darker regions represent lower scattering. Um, it probably covers, uh, and I, so I apologize, there's no scale bar on it, but um, uh, typically it would cover a 30 dB to 40 dB dynamic range. Uh, and so it's, um, if you look at linear scale OCT images, uh, they quickly, um, you, you lose quite a lot of information. So log scale helps to bring all of these scatterers up together. And part of that is just because of the fact that you have such strong extinction with depth. So, um, you know, you have, uh, you have, uh, you know, 50 dB between the surface and, uh, and a millimeter in depth. And you want to try to capture all that image information in a single, uh, a single system and view it at a single instant in time. So yes, usually they're logarithmic scale. Right, and the darker areas are, are probably water, possibly lymph vessels, maybe blood vessels. I think you've done a lot of work showing that, you know, where you have almost zero signal, then that's probably lymph or at least water. And if you have maybe 20 dB above that, you have uh, probably blood vessels. Is that roughly? crudely correct? Uh, yeah, and I guess but below the blood vessels, it often appears dark as well, and that, that is because the uh, image information has been scrambled and uh, you're unable to re retrieve it. So in, in a sense, that's a type of, um, almost like a type of speckle. Um, yeah, while you mentioned this, uh, the scale bar there, this is a, a bit of a bugbear in, in OCT generally, and more so I think in the in the biological side of it. I, I think L-shaped uh, um, scale bars are, are really, really useful uh, because quite often OCT images don't have the scale in X and Y and we need to be really uh, encourage everybody to to use those. You give the scale on, on the left hand side anyway, so that 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 is the information is there. Um, but it's really important that people put that information because, you know, ultimately most of us are physicists and engineers and we just need to know the dimensions. Right? Um, so, um, rule number one, completely agree, Martin. You know, how many times I look at images where I don't see the scale bars, it's absolutely unforgivable. And again, we do ourselves a disservice as a community if we don't uh, adopt the level of professionalism when it comes to presenting our data. 
Um, the other angle that's important to remember when it comes to OCT is what is the unit of depth? Um, because often people um, just simply uh, uh, include uh, what you would call optical depth. So that's actually the physical depth multiplied by the group index. Um, so it's in skin, it's typically, or in many tissues, it's typically 1.4 times uh, lo longer, bigger than, than the actual physical depth because OCT is sensitive to the, uh, the, the, the group uh, delay length and not the physical delay length. Um, the, two, the two are obviously related, but we don't actually generally know the group index. So there is an intrinsic uncertainty um, in, in many OCT images and people often forget to, to rescale their data to present physical depth. So I spend a lot of time um, asking my team to include the refractive index, uh, state whether it's physical or optical depth. Um, there needs to be clarity around that, and there's often ambiguity around that. Yeah, so th that's a really interesting point. So what is your preference then? Uh, I think people go, at least in the physics-based journals, uh, for the optical depth on the basis that they feel that that's the most accurate thing to say and they're not making a mistake by saying it. But as you say, actually, we don't really know the group refractive index. So you're, you know, um, I suppose they're worried that if if you if if you multiply by a typical refractive index or, or what you think is the refractive index and you present it as actual depth or real depth, uh, that maybe somebody will say, well, you know, that's not accurate or how do you know? Or Yeah, well, I personally think that, you know, um, scaling things as close to what you understand to be the real scale uh, is the best way to go. Now, people sometimes treat the X and Y scales uh, with a different magnification than the Z scale. And so you end up with distorted, you know, it, typically uh, elongated images or, um, or, you know, or they're, 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 um, they're distorted relative to what they, they their real dimensions are. Now, yes, I know we've got an uncertainty in the axial dimension, but as long as you state how you've scaled it, then at least you yeah. know you're getting close to reality, closer than you were before. I think it's easy to get foxed by um, um, by, by uh, distorted images. You know, it's easy to just overlook the fact that they're distorted and come away with a false impression. So I, I, I you know, I always try to get as close to reality as as we can. Yeah, I'm, I'm w totally with you on that. I think, you know, it, the idea that somehow if you have, if you deliberately include a 50% distortion in the image and in, in some dimension, uh, that that's more accurate than making your best efforts to to do it and have a one or two percent distortion. Well, you know, um, at least you're you, you know you've made your best effort and it and it looks more or less like the you know the context it should be in. That that's and and uh, I think there's two other elements there that are worth mentioning. One is that you can obviously pick up the distortion in an image by looking at the shape of the speckle. Mm, how, yeah. how uh, what, you know, what, what is the three dimensional shape of the speckle? Um, but that doesn't tell you whether there is actually a differential physical uh, resolution difference in the transverse versus axial, or is it just a presentational difference and that distortion has been created through stretching um, when you're presenting. But many OCT systems have lateral resolutions which are substantially different to their axial resolutions, and it can go either way. So, you know, ultra high resolution can have, you know, uh, one micron, 1.5 micron axial resolution and 10 micron lateral resolution. Well, that's 10 to one, that's nearly 10 to one. Um, and, uh, but it can go the other way. You can have, you know, 25 micron lateral resolution imaging systems in the eye with two micron um, axial resolution. So you just need to bear that in mind. And again, I, I think it is generally more helpful in trying to understand and interpret images to create a system which has some degree of symmetry, as much iso isotropy in resolution as you can manage. OK, Maria Pilar uh, in Spain wants to know, regarding the previous question of light sources, can multiple uh, lasers be used for OCT measurements, so using more than one laser at once? Uh, y uh, yes, uh, but um, it depends how you want to combine them. So if you want 
to combine them coherently, that's very challenging. So to get the true unambiguous um, resolution as if they were combined, uh, they generally need to have some form of phase referencing between them. Uh, now that type of technology exists for optical frequency combs, um, but is not widely available. It's um, quite challenging. Uh, if you want to incoherently combine them, uh, then um, that that's, can still be useful and uh, and is sometimes done. Uh, I guess uh, differential absorption OCT was popular for a while, where people looked at um, you know a measurement uh, uh, at uh, uh, in a frequency band that had a strong absorption relative to another frequency band. Um, Joe Schmidt did a bit of work on that. Uh, but I guess the thing is that generally you add a layer of complexity which uh, doesn't produce the benefit that you were hoping for. Um, I think that that's, uh, hence you don't see that used a great deal in practice. Now, what you do see used in practice though is, is combined SLDs. Um, and again, they're combined incoherently. Um, um, but uh, if, if you combine that in a, in a spectral domain system, it doesn't matter. The, the source, the, the, any single individual source is incoherent. Uh, therefore, multiple versions of, of that uh, can simply be added and, uh, and you get a lumpy looking uh, spectral profile, but then with post-processing, you can uh, correct for that and turn it back into a Gaussian-like spectral shape, which produces a nice uh, point spread function. Okay, Julian uh, Tampu at Linchping. Uh, uh, liked your lectures and your optics labeled gadgets. Um, so can polarization sensitive OCT image neutron fibers, I guess, does he mean neuron fibers in, in brain tissue? Yeah, I guess you're talking about neurons. And, um, you know, the thing is, um, I haven't seen much really compelling data uh, on imaging the brain, um, but um, I sort of feel that uh, things are improving. And uh, I think polarization sensitive OCT is a really interesting uh, direction to go in when it comes to uh, imaging some of these uh, uh, structures that have uh, myelin sheaths attached to them. And uh, the work that I think of when I think of that is work from Ben Vakosh's group uh, who have been imaging uh, nerves and they've been They've done some beautiful work on imaging um, repair technologies. So the nerve is damaged, it is, uh, it is soldered, uh, stitched back together, and then imaged versus time to show how it, uh, how it uh, re recovers. And the, the contrast that you get from optic axis imaging there is exquisite, really fantastic. So I think you could do similar things uh, in brain tissue, um, but brain tissue comes with a lot of scattering. And so, uh, and, and often quite low contrast. So it's um, the, the early work looked quite unpromising. In many ways, I compare it to the early work in uh, oral uh, tissue. A lot of people have done um, oral cancer studies with OCT, which don't look promising. You just look at the image information, you can't really interpret anything. Um, we've started to do it with polarization sensitive OCT, and straight away, you start to be able to see the fibrous matrix, um, which is present. And so you start to see structural information that you previously couldn't see. So I think that, you know, that, that therefore that suggests promise in being able to extract um, different information than has been being probed previously through looking at this different contrast mechanism. I guess one of the uh, challenges that we all face um, in, in, in approaching these problems is that every time we look at a new um, particular application, you sort of have to go back to the drawing board and completely examine it from scratch to understand where the contrast lies, what modality is going to give us the best answer. And then when we do that in single groups scattered around the world, uh, we make slow progress. Um, you know, we, we, we do make slow progress. There's a lot of diversity out there and there's not enough of us to be able to systematically tackle some of these things, decide if we've got a solution or not, and then move on. So we do move forward slowly on, in some areas. All right, uh, Julian also wants to know, are for the thermal methods of perturbing the tissue to measure elastic properties in OCT elastography similar to 
the ones used in photoacoustic imaging? And if yes, can you see a possible combination of these two modalities? Yeah, I think the answer is yes. And there has been some uh, interesting work done on this. I think it's proven to be very challenging uh, to get enough um, motion, detectable, detectable motion from the photo absorption uh, and uh, without damaging the tissue, uh, without actually simply doing damage. I guess the absorption is low. Um, I haven't done that work myself, so I don't really have a good feel for it. Um, but uh, certainly uh, the work that has been done uh, using AirPuff uh, seems to generate much more um, uh, usable results than does the photothermal work, um, which is surprising. I mean, you know, uh, Ricky Wang's done a lot of the photothermal work and uh, uh, you know, Matt O'Donnell, who I think you've already heard from, um, is an expert in, in, the, uh, in the acoustics uh, area. So if anyone was going to crack it, those guys would. Um, but I'm not sure they're using um, that approach systematically. Um, yeah. So I'm quite sure what's missing there. But uh, but it might be that you need photoabsorbers. You know, I think uh, like you do for, um, for a great enhancer of photoacoustics is to have um, you know nano part nanorods or some form of absorber which greatly enhances your sensitivity. I think likewise would be true for for elastography. Yeah, the, the structures are that you're trying to image with elastography are typically non-absorbing, right? They're they're white scattering um, structures. I, I guess it, another difficulty, even if you do manage to have uh, absorption, you're going to change the refractive index, right? Which doesn't really bother photoacoustics, but uh, isn't that going to be a mess up your OCT signal? Uh, well, it, it, it creates contrast potentially, so yes, it could potentially alter the image. I don't think we see that though. I don't think I've seen that in practice. Um, uh, good question, actually. I, I think you could. I think you could see that. Yeah, I mean the the method of, of photo is it called photothermal OCT? Melissa Scala and others have done it. We've dabbled in it. Um, it you know works on the basis of changing the refractive index of the yes. uh, of the material, right? So so it does give you the contrast, yes. Um, yeah, so that, that is your signal. So whether that you decide that that's messing it up or or giving it a signal depends on how you interpret it and, and how you control it, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, I, mean, I think the thing there is uh, whether or not the, um, you know, as we said before, the group delay that you're measuring is, you know, um, refractive index times physical length. Uh, if you change the physical length or you change the refractive index, they both produce uh, a, a, a change in, in the uh, in the axial position of a structure. And uh, and so yeah, you can use either. Um, but I think the change that you get by you know squashing the surface of the uh, sample by a few microns is substantially larger than maybe the nanometer scale change you get by altering the refractive index. So the, the sensitivities of the two could be quite different, but it has the advantage, uh, the photothermal has the advantage of being potentially non-contact. Okay, there's also a scale issue. Photothermal is looking, or sorry, photoacoustic is looking much deeper, I guess, and, and OCT is, is, is on a much shallower scale. That again could be an advantage. Maybe the reason you combine them is you want the detail uh, in the short depth that you get with OCT. You might wonder why wouldn't you do that with photoacoustic microscopy? Maybe they would be easier to integrate, um, but in any case, that, that there is a scaling issue. Uh, uh, a, I mean, uh, let me just address the issue of complementarity. Um, I mean, they ideally those the two methodologies are quite complementary because you should be able to penetrate uh, much deeper with photoacoustic measurements uh, if you retain the surface and uh, near surface measurements from OCT, then potentially you can combine the two. Um, so that in that sense, they're quite nicely complementary. Um, that said, uh, a lot of times I see photoacoustic data, which looks like it's sort of attacking the same parameter space as OCT. And that, that to me, I wonder about the, the why, why you'd be doing that. Uh, because of the expense or the complexity of it by comparison to OCT or, or what? Yeah, so and and <clears throat> and the uh, constraints on the sample, you know, in the, in the interface between the sample and the instrument, mm -hmm. usually the need for contact with water. <laughs> um, right. Um, 
Julian again asks, um, with respect to shadow artifacts, do you think it will be possible to recover the information below the highly scattered structures by collecting data from multiple angles, thus each acquisition giving a glimpse of what is below? Um, so there has been some work done on that um, through um, uh, the group at, um, uh, in Oregon, and uh, I think they are demonstrating that those approaches and, and some approaches to uh, how you do the signal processing can partially re recuperate, um, recover the situation. Um, but I haven't really seen super convincing three-dimensional data in which somehow all of the shadows have been retrieved. I think that's a tough problem. Uh, and then every time you add another view, another angle, you've got yourself a major processing problem. You've got a major registration problem. Um, you've got potential distortions that uh, vary according now to angle, so that you know, you're not actually probing the same voxel um, from different angles. The actual voxel itself is not the same shape when you look from different angles. So you know, there, there, it's not a, um, technically trivial to be able to do that. Um, but I think it's certainly possible the question is, is it worth the effort? Right, uh, Adolphe in Ivory Coast wants to know, uh, there are different uh, types of interferometric systems and do they have an impact on OCT imaging? So I guess, th does it depend on the interferometer that you use? Yeah, I mean, you know, uh, all of the classic interferometers are being used in OCT in one form or another, Linux interferometer, Mirau interferometer, um, you know, Max Zender interferometers, Mickelson interferometers, you name it, um, we we have a go at using it. Um, and uh, and all of these things have different uh, pros and cons and uh, and all, all find a home one way or another. But the, the, the classic, um, you know, interferometers remain, um, uh, you know, essentially the standard Max Zender um, or Mickelson. Um, and uh, and then we, we do the rest um, with with points point focused and then beam scanning. Uh, the, uh, the the Miro interferometer with a, is a sort of like effectively common path. That's quite interesting because that allows you to create the interferometer at the end of your uh, imaging system, uh, which means that you've got very compact and very resistant to um, to, to to noise and to vibration. Um, and that's uh, you know that that's that's in effect um, uh, in effect the Telesto system from Thor Labs functions in that way, although it's not strictly a mirror interferometer. But it's it's very close to it, um, having all the interference in the in the head that you actually put on the sample. Okay, Ben Moon uh, from Rochester wants to know: Can you comment on the strengths and weaknesses of the various tissue deformation processes in? optical coherence elastography, static compression, shear waves, etc. How should you choose which method to use for a given application? Yeah, well, that's a really good question. And, uh, you know, and, and it does completely depend on the application. And so, you know, for the cornea, if you're thinking about doing in vivo measurements, anything which actually makes physical contact with the cornea is going to be a major headache. You know, just through patient compliance, you know, it's it's uncomfortable to have more than even even that little puffy thing that um, we all put up with at the moment. That the uh, optometrists is annoying, and uh, so think about contacting something more systematically or more extensively. That that's not really viable. So you must have a non-contact solution. So how is that? You know, if you have a non-contact solution, then the next question is, well, what information are you looking for? Are you looking for properties that are average across? The whole of the cornea? Are you looking at uh, for a map? What sort of map do you need? Is it the lens you're actually trying to probe? Um, all of these things start to pin down uh, exactly what parameters you can use. Um, it's pretty clear that um, shear wave elastography has a lot to offer and it has been has become very popular in ultrasound, um, but I think it's also clear that um, compression uh, overall uh, is uh, a very functional technique because it produces quite high resolution over quite large fields of view. Uh, so it too is useful when you can make contact. 
to do compression elastography without contact, that's actually quite tricky. Um, I think one of the areas that everybody's interested in looking at, though, is intrinsic intrinsic elastography. So that is elastography where you don't extrinsically apply some probe and you use the fact that there is Brownian motion, that there is thermal energy in the system or that there is body motion created by pulsatility, created by your heartbeat, created by your breathing. Um, and if you um, can exploit that, then, then you've got a really powerful system. And people have started to look at that and I don't think we've really cracked it yet, but um, I think that's a very interesting avenue. And now whether you then detect that with um, you know, detect shear waves resulting from that or whether you detect just bulk motion uh, or local motion, um, you know, that, that I think has yet to be really properly teased out. Or whether you detect Bruin phonons, <laughs> not OCT at all. Okay. Um, we have a question. Could, could you please do some comparison between uh, OCTA techniques, what OCTA technique is most promising in your opinion? I've just unmuted myself. Some, some, what, some cheeky um, administrator out there <laughs> muted me. <laughs> there was a little bit of wind noise, um, which, which seems to be coming from your microphone. So we were trying to figure out what that is, but it's it's not uh, it's not huge. It's just yeah. It's probably coming from the fan from my computer. Let ah, me okay. see if I can change where my microphone is coming from. Yeah, it was better earlier, I think. Yeah. Maybe your computer is getting hotter. <laughs> yeah, I'm using. Uh, let me just try. How's that? Is that better? Yeah, I think that's gone now. Yeah. Good. I've just, I have too many options. I have three microphones and three cameras and so, uh, and Teams keeps deciding which ones to choose and I have to keep changing them. Um, so so uh, the question was, uh, remind me of the question again. Comparison between OCTA techniques and yeah. which do you think is most promising? Oh, look, I mean, that is a headache, uh, I have to say. Um, you know, I, I think, uh, we've done quite a bit of uh, work on looking at different variants and um, I have to say it's quite empirical. I don't think we've really got a good handle on exactly uh, which which variable, which parameter um, is going to allow you to design the optimum system. So, you know, recently we I showed in the lecture, we, we looked at um, multiple B scans at a single location and we looked at short time Fourier transforms, um, they, that produces a sensitivity advantage. Uh, we then looked at polarization sensitive OCT, that presents a sensitivity advantage as well. Um, but then which processing method you use, which, ver which ver you know, whether you look at um, uh, intensity only, whether you look at intensity and phase techniques, uh, whether you look at the split spectrum methods that have been developed uh, from Oregon and that are widely used in ophthalmology, that that is a much more complex uh, and difficult to navigate space. So I would not like to um, present to you that I know the answer to that. Uh, I mean, there are a number of reviews that I would recommend to you, and I haven't cited them all in my um, uh, in, in my lecture. There's particularly a number of reviews in the ophthalmology. So in OCT, OCTA generally now is, you know, is a, is a uh, referred to probably very uh, routinely in the ophthalmology community. Uh, and there are a number of clinical reviews. Um, I, I referred you to the review by uh, Ricky Wang uh, in the um, uh, commemorative uh, OCT issue in Biomedical Optics Express. Um, and uh, uh, at the beginning of 2017. And uh, that one contains a good overview. Um, but but really getting to the bottom of that story, I, I think that's a piece of work still to be done. And I think, I think I would make the observation that often in OCT, really getting to the bottom of a, of a technical issue from a theoretical um, conceptual standpoint is, is a weakness of, in the field. Often we don't do that. We, we solve problems at an engineering level and we crack on with empirical solutions, but we don't necessarily fully deeply understand how we should be tackling the problem. So I think it's an interesting area for somebody, a deep thinker um, to, to, to re-engage with. 
Thank you for that. Uh, Luca in Strasbourg wants to know what do you think of the biggest challenges to address for real time and eventually 3D endoscopic OCT in the digestive system, especially the colon? Well, I think the question there is again, what are you looking for? Um, I think uh, what problem are you trying to solve? The, the capacity to see the surface of the colon with in real time with very high resolution was what the endoscopic um, uh, confocal systems provided uh, and what the Mauna Kea uh, confocal endoscope pro provides today. But that doesn't seem to be enough in some instances. So in some instances, what you're looking for is how far a tumor uh, or a lesion has penetrated and so what stage it is at and uh, and that to, to see that you you want to be able to penetrate a number of millimeters in depth and often you can't get deep enough to get the answer to that so so that's one area of clinical application that is is um is not solving your the problem you're not solving um the thing is when you're looking at surface effects then actually a very good um uh, high grade endoscope gives you almost as much information as does a confocal microscope. It just requires a high performance imaging instrument. So there's some very nice uh, work done. Uh, um, um, you know, you, even if you use a Storz rigid endoscope or you use one of the endoscopes developed by uh, Eric Seibel out of uh, Seattle, um, you know, those uh, the quality of the images you get at the surface are very, uh, very high and you can see you know, uh, cellular scale surface structures. But then seeing what's going on beneath the surface, you're completely lost on that. So that may not be solving your clinical problem. So I, I think that's part of the issue is that, you know, what what uh, aspect of clinical application are you looking to address? And I come back to that point that, you know, you we want to make sure we're solving the right problem. And yeah, yeah I mean, I mean, I think Brian Wilson wrote a review in JBO on uh, gastroendoscopy uh, probably, gee whiz, probably a decade ago now, uh, in which, you know, he pointed out one of the fundamental issues is that people can't tell where the, whether the basement membrane has been penetrated, but the basement membrane is sort of one and a half to three millimetres beneath the surface. Um, and, you know, that remains a, a fundamental challenge. How do we get that deep? Right. So, look, uh, you could you could readdress that that question to Brian when he comes up uh, later in the week um, as well. Uh, he, he'll be he'll be along. Um, I, on the other hand, uh, I thought I saw a statistic that 80 percent of cancers are epithelial in nature, at least in their first manifestation. So um, they should be rather superficial. And I th are you referring to narrow band imaging techniques? You know, these for single example. wavelength. Yeah. For example, yeah, sure. Um, but you know, uh, it was a it was a it was a very hot topic, uh, probably about a decade ago at Photonics West, uh, that um, in the literature there was controversy over the uh, significance of Barrett's esophagus. So Barrett's esophagus is this precancer stage that um, you know everyone was seeking to detect. Uh, but then somebody came along and said, "Well, uh, actually, the connection between uh, Barrett's esophagus and full-blown ad adenocarcinoma uh, is not uh, what we all thought it was." Uh, in which case, the ground has moved. You know, the problem that you thought you were solving is turning out to be the uh, uh, um, not the right problem. Now, the same is true. Uh, for imaging um, uh, uh, lymph nodes in uh, for breast cancer, um, that you know the 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 notion of the sentinel lymph node and what to do um, if you had an active sentinel lymph node, the the way in which that is important and how it's to, how it guides treatment, um, the recommendations on that are hotly contested and have varied over the years. Um, so has the um, the the, uh, the notion of margin detection. How what what is a thin margin? Um, you know how how thin should a margin be uh, in order to uh, for for there to be uh, reexcision in breast cancer? So I guess the point is we have to track uh, what's going on in medicine, and as thinking and understanding changes, we may have to adapt. And yes, if, again, if you solve you know the pro a problem 
because you can detect Barrett's esophagus, but then everybody decides that detecting Barrett's esophagus is not uh, meaningful in the treatment of adenocarcinoma or it's misleading in some way, uh, then you've got to adapt and solve a different problem. Um, so that's just something we need to bear in mind. Right. At, at some point, I remember the FDA um, had a position that unless you see two millimeters deep, uh, your technique is, is essentially irrelevant for margin detection. It, has that changed? Is that still um, an issue? It does seem to wipe out OCT <laughs> as, a, as, a, as a way of approaching the problem. Uh, it, I think it places great challenges on ICT. So I'm not sure. I'm not sure what the FDA uh, recommendations currently say. I haven't kept abreast of that. Um, but but you know there are a couple of ways of actually probing that information. So when it comes to elastography, uh, if you use uh, optical palpation, um, that actually probes many millimeters deep into the tissue. And if you combine that with uh, inverse uh, an inverse model and you can back out structures. Uh, it's very reminiscent of the way in which um, sound waves are used to probe underground oil reservoirs. Um, and that is that by looking at um, a signature gained from echograms that, um, uh, you know, from, from partial information, you're able to uh, resolve what the subsurface structures are. In optical palpation, essentially what you're doing is you're using OCT to measure uh, the deformation of a surface structure, um, but that deformation depends upon what's underneath it. Uh, and so right. you can you can get, I mean, it, uh, in our early work, we showed that you could comfortably detect objects five millimeters beneath the surface. Now, obviously you start to lose resolution, you start to gain ambiguity, it's, uh, it's, not, it's not straightforward, but that's one possible way to deal with that. Of course, the other way to deal with it is to design a probe which is able to penetrate the surface of the tissue and thus all of the work that um, I've done on needle imaging was is directed towards that very end. It's not non-invasive uh, and so it's, its applicability depends upon the application, but it carries the OCT imaging to the site uh, that you need to probe. And I, I hope Caroline's um, uh, has uh, has has, has um, delivered some interesting lectures that um, that touch on that. Yeah, we're we're going to catch up with Caroline uh, later today, I believe. Uh, so, yeah, uh, very good. Uh, but that's an important point. You know, it's how how do you get to as long as you get to where you need to image and it provides the image in a way which is acceptable for that uh, technique, and that provides information that could change the clinicians. Um, the clinician's decision. Uh, somebody mentioned a, a reimbursement code, I think earlier today, maybe that was you or maybe that was late last night. These things are becoming blurry for me, uh, but uh, we should explain that a reimbursement code is, is a, in a sense thought of as a holy grail, but basically it means that it's clinically accepted and to the point where the insurance companies are willing to pay for it. Um, so it so they will pay the, the unit a certain amount of money, 90 euros, $90, whatever it is, to make a scan using this particular technique because it could um, improve the patient outcome. Yeah, uh, and I think we all have to remember that when we talk about reimbursement codes, we're mainly talking about uh, the United States. Um, there's no such thing as a reimbursement code in the National Health Service here in the UK. Um, there is an equivalent in the Australian system, but it all depends on your healthcare system. But but the important point to remember is that advanced uh, medical devices, you know, something like uh, you know, a 80 or 90 percent of the global market is actually in the US. So the US is traditionally the point at which these advanced uh, medical devices are first taken up. And so if you're starting a company uh, in OCT and you're not um, trying to crack the North American market, then um, you know, that's that's uh, that's unlikely. You're, you're going to have to focus on the US market, right? Um, yeah, uh, I guess there there are opportunities there in in other parts of the world for for some of the lower applying low tech um, and uh, you know uh, some approaches where, for example. Uh, the alternative or the, the state of the art equipment is never likely to be available. I mean, even for in in many parts of the US and Europe, you know, most people 
won't access an MRI just just because uh, not that it's inaccessible it, uh, physically. It's just that uh, the cost involved and the amount of time taken and so on, the planning permission to have that machine in the building just means that uh, uh, doctors generally won't uh, prescribe that unless that's the only way forward, right? Um, yeah, and and I, and I think the thing is low cost solutions don't necessarily uh, only address issues in the developing world. Low cost solutions, I mean, it's very interesting. We, we're developing uh, technology here at the University of Surrey to do very quick testing for COVID-19. Uh, and, um, and we're going off to test it uh, at the Scottish Open. So we're going off to the golf tournament and it's going to be rolled out to test all the people attending the golf to test whether or not they have COVID. But actually, the main market for it is in uh, is is in developing countries uh, that um, uh, want relatively low cost testing. But the subsidiary market is going to be the sports, you know, uh, sort of uh, an an outdoor entertainment um, facilities going on in in Europe. So it's a um, it's it's a you know, it's a relatively complex picture, but low cost is really important and low cost OCT um, uh, is particularly important because it will open up many new applications that simply can't can't be afforded right now. And so, um, again, I know Martin's done some work on low cost OCT. Uh, the recent developments by Adam Wax of uh, Lumedica, um, uh, specifically targeting sort of bargain um, bargain OCT systems with clever optical design, uh, which enables uh, you know, plastic 3D printed parts to maintain stability uh, as an imaging system. You know, that type of thing um, you know, will, will lead to advances, which, the, which then open up other doors for us coming in behind to re-examine you know, technical matters. So when we spoke earlier about combining photoacoustics with OCT, at the moment that, that's very expensive and complicated. But some of these engineering advances might allow you to revisit that to do it in such a way that it becomes cost effective, in which case, um, you know, um, it opens doors to new applications. And we always have to, those of us that have been in the field long enough um, can become a bit jaundiced. You know, we adopt certain uh, viewpoints by saying, oh, well, that's impossible. That's never going to happen. But actually, we have to remember that circumstances change and some of the things that were previously impossible need to be revisited. And I think that started in OCT with three-dimensional imaging, so volumetric imaging. The fact that we could crap, capture an OCT volume rather than just a single depth section mm -hmm. uh, scan, um, that really was a paradigm shift. And I, I, I'm not sure we recognised it as such quite as much at the time as as we should have, because it, it really changed out, it changed a lot of thinking, and and um, to, you know, and we're, we're benefiting from that still. Yeah, aren't we in the business of doing the impossible? <laughs> and that would make our, our field exciting um, or, or science in general very exciting. Uh, if we have slide 11 from lecture six, then uh, Kai Nyhaus is asking um, about elastography. It shows an overview of the excitation methods. Are there attempts to use electric fields to induce biomechanical excitation? And what may be the challenges of using electric fields for biomechanical excitation? Uh, well, look, if you if you take a pair of electrodes and you attach it to the uh, muscle of a frog in a petri dish, uh, you can make it twitch. <laughs> and so, uh, you know, the body, tish, many tissues are electrically active. And so, so yes, the short answer is. If you have a reason for doing that, it could be very effective. Um, uh, actually, you can do that optically non-contact. I've seen some lovely work uh, done on direct nerve stimulation, uh, where in a mouse model, you, uh, you you zap the mouse somewhere on its cheek and its, uh, its little whiskers happily twitch away. Um, uh, so you can use it as, a, as, a, as an effective stimulation mechanism for sure. Um, but I, don't, I just don't think the work has been done. People haven't been looking at that. Um, and you have you, you need an application, you need a reason for doing it. What mechanical property are you trying to measure? Um, obviously, if you twitch a whole muscle, uh, then that might give you some average measure, but um, actually often you are looking for what's going on at the local level within that muscle. 
And so are you able to probe that effectively? Um, uh, and um, every every uh, stimulus method um, uh, does, if you, I guess my point is, if you stimulate a whole tissue, uh, then you have the complexity of um, a notional set of springs and dampers that are all interconnected. So imagine the biological tissue as a whole set of springs and dampers that are all connected to one another. Uh, so you know you you poke you poke it in the middle and all all the springs move around a bit. Um, or if you poke them all at the same time, then they all move around a bit in different. That's very different excitation. You've got to be able to yeah. tease out at the end of the day what's going on with one of those springs. You want to know the spring constant of one of them. Um, and so if you stimulate them all you've got a, a challenging problem to tease. It does make me wonder though, could you combine with optogenetics and and um, make these springs, uh, well, very specific springs, um, photoactivatable, or you can make different ones activatable with different colors of light or different wavelengths of light. And, and you can make them, um, you know, you can make them sing a dance at different times and then get different uh, images and, and see where everything is and how it's responding. Well, I think that's that uh, strikes me as something that would be very uh, for, uh, cell mechanics, and uh, you know, done at the cellular scale. And uh, so, again, whether whether or not on that scale it's best probed by optical coherence elastography remains to be seen. You know, I I've always been promoting elastography uh, with OCT in that what I call the mesoscale range, so the range between single cells and whole tissues, where you've got um, tens to hundreds, t say ten to a thousand cells. Um, you know, what you'd really like to be able to probe, you know, in tissue engineering, for example, is, is what's going on uh, at the cellular scale, but for a cell that is surrounded by enough cells and tissue and matrix for it to, to be behaving normally. Uh, now, of course, when you take a cell and you put it on a two dimensional substrate, it's not behaving normally anymore. Um, and uh, when you just uh, take a big enough uh, chunk of whole tissue, then you can't get to that uh, that region in the middle. OCT gives you the chance to do that. And we've demonstrated that uh, briefly uh, working with mouse aorta, but we haven't done it systematically. And I think it's an interesting area to continue to pursue. Yeah, I, I think I was thinking more in terms of the brain, where mouse brain, for example, where you could you you could uh, get get the neurons of a particular type, maybe associated with epilepsy or something like that, to to all fire and see when they're firing and when do they get triggered and why does this happen. Um, but but it, you know it might be useful to have OCT to do that because maybe the other techniques don't have the depth to to see what's going on. You could see as far as the hippocampus with, with OCT, with the you know kind of stuff that Ricky Wang has done and so on. Yeah, um, and that, that uh, raises an important point, Martin, and that is that, you know, um, everything I presented to you uh, is about OCT, uh, but there are other methods. And I think in the brain, uh, there it's really important to remember that uh, multi-photon microscopy is able to penetrate considerably deeper than OCT. Um, so, you know, uh, Chris Zhu's three photon work has demonstrated penetration to uh, to well over a millimetre uh, into, you know, getting into the sort of uh, fractions of the second millimetre and um, but being able to still retain, uh, you know, cellular scale neuro image individual neurons. Um, and that, I think, outperforms anything that OCT can do in that tissue. And so uh -huh. it's not automatic that OCT penetrates more deeply uh, than every other method in every circumstance. Um, and yeah, I forget the details, but I know that Ricky Wang, um, Ricky Wang put it, had a paper in JBO um, that showed imaging to, I think about 2.4 millimeters in the mouse brain, but you know, maybe there were special circumstances, but uh, uh, yeah, that and and really getting to the hippocampus, which I thought was you know an important. And this is another important point. You know, just getting deeper, you know, some percentage deeper is a, kind of irrelevant from a clinical or as uh, a discovery point of view. Is do you see something new, or do you see does it enable you to do something different to what you did before, yeah. right? Yeah, and the image quality. I guess you've got to you know what are you able to see. Right. 
yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, uh, that that's that's a whole other issue. Um, Ashwin at SRM in India is asking: Is there any scope for OCT in in vitro cellular imaging? Uh, though we have su superior uh, resolution microscopes for imaging cells, is there still scope for OCT? Uh, I I think that um, you know yes, if you are looking at um, uh, at spheroids um, and beyond, so things that are sphe spheroids or bigger. So so you know the thing is most microscopy methods work well up to you know maybe up to 10 microns deep um, but beyond that they start to struggle with aberration and um, you know and, and you, but but it's a really valid point and that is that you should you know if you're using an advanced microscopy technique you should be benchmarking it against the standard methods so get out a transmission light microscope put your put your largely transparent cellular sample under it and see what you can see and then put it under your multi-photon microscope and see that you are actually seeing something different and better rather than just something different. Um, and I think the same is true with OCT, but I wouldn't expect OCT uh, to outcompete uh, at, uh, at the very thin sections. But if you are outcompeting, you must remember what you, the way that you have to outcompete is you have to build a proper microscope. And when you build that proper microscope, you've got to have a proper aberration corrected objective lens and you've got to do all the same things that you that you need to do to build a high performance microscope. And again, I refer back to the work by Claude Bocquerel's group that has been commercialized through LL Tech. If you look at the LL Tech uh, instrument and you look at the performance of it, it's a, it's a proper microscope, but it's an interferometric microscope. It's actually an OCT instrument. It's a full field OCT instrument. <coughs> or you might argue it's an OCM instrument. But all these things start to blur together. Um, mm -hmm. if you want the resolution, you've got to be building a high performance optical instrument. OK, and yeah, and <laughs> like you say, it's it's got to be not just a pretty picture, but show something which is um, an advance and, and, and useful. Uh, Lukas Landorf wants to know what are your thoughts on OCT based oximetry with visible light, for example, how Zhang's work in Northwestern, which is really nice. I know that. Um, do you think this will gain a larger following? So <clears throat> that's a really interesting question because my intrinsic feeling is it should. But a few years ago, I um, was writing a grant proposal and I did a lot of work on um, investigating oximetry in general. And it turns out there's actually ve the, there's very, very few citations in oximetry. Um, and so there's not much going on. It's not a very big field, even though you think it should be a big field. So, so I'm not quite sure as to why that is the case, but I was um, digging and digging and digging and keep ex keeping expecting to find this large subfield of people working in oximetry around the planet and, you know, looking at, I was particularly interested in delivering oximetry systems through needles um, at, um, uh, at, at, you know, at very high resolution, very deep in the tissue and uh, looking at, at using some of these uh, advanced OCT techniques to, to be able to do that. But I couldn't really see the um, the excitement and scale of the field. Now, of course, that doesn't mean that it's not worth doing. And my feeling is that it's a really interesting area. Um, we've just done some work on pulsatility and angiography, and I think um, understanding particularly microvascular behavior uh, and its connection to cardiovascular disease uh, and other diseases like diabetes is really is you know is, is a really interesting topic um, so I feel there is there is mileage there but um, they're, not, they're not all rushing there it would appear all right as far as I know he's got a company is, is it being taken up by the clinicians at all or do you know? Do you have any insight into that? I mean, is it the case, you know, sometimes citations is not the best way to uh, to measure these things. You know, if it's disseminated by commercialization, that's that's just as good, I guess, in my book, uh, maybe better sometimes. Um, oh, and, so yeah. I'd say it's just a measure of the size of the field, you know. Uh, and, and it might be that there's just less people working in that area, right? I think so. 
I think so. Um, uh, so I don't I don't know um, anything about that company, so I can't comment. But uh, but um, you know, I, I again I feel that uh, sort of, uh, oximetry at resolution uh, in almost any tissue presents opportunities for a greater depth of understanding of physiology. How that then converts to treatment um, or to um, you know, other commercial opportunities, I guess I'm not so sure. Um, but understanding is 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 vital. Right? I mean, there's still, there's still a huge amount not well understood about the interplay between um, you know it, between metabolic activity uh, in in our central nervous system, including in our retina, and uh, and and the associated vasculature and the related oximetry. Um, you know that that that's uh, I mean that is that is a, still a, su a subject of extensive study in the brain. Um, and it's at early stages in the retina and in the peripheral uh, circulation, I think it's just not studied. Okay, Anand and Galway says you did a good amount of work in burn injury imaging. How do you see this, uh, the commercial success of OCT in this area? Which parametric model suits best for this application? In the case of phase sensitive, I, I, oh, sorry, maybe that's polarization sensitive OCT, you mentioned that uh, high sensitivity imaging is desired. Do you think the clinical industry can afford expensive OCT system for burn imaging? So I guess this is an important point. Do you, how do you match the cost of the system to the application? Yeah, you know, I think I think that's uh, fundamental in uh, in in many clinical applications. And burns is a case in point. Um, you know, burns is not a mainstream area of medicine it can be high profile when uh, there are major incidents and lots of people get burnt um, but in general it's a relatively small number of patients so it's low volume as a result it gets sort of low attention um, and um, but clinicians uh, you know need need solutions that are, are, are effective they have a short attention span that's got to be quick um, and exactly what the clinical problem is uh, is a really good uh, is a really good um, question in many instances. So we've been working for a number of years on the upper airway um, and uh, imaging the shape of the upper airway and its dimensions uh, initially for work in sleep apnea. But we've but we always had our burn surgeon looking over our shoulder, um, saying, uh, you know, this is this would be really interesting for me to know what the uh, airway looks like for my burns patients, because many burns patients inhale, um, you know, hot uh, gases and, and actually have um, internal burn injuries in their airway. Their airway then swells. And uh, the point at which they have to be intubated uh, is a very significant clinical uh, sort of a, a decision point. And if you don't have to intubate them, then uh, they usually do much better. Uh, so understanding what's going on on the inside uh, appears to be a challenge, but you know it's not easy to design the right solution there. So when we started actually working with clinicians to say, well, what exactly is it that you need, and what do we have to achieve to be able to do that? Well, at the end of the day, it's not it's not black and white. So so they would say, well, I already have a video endoscope, so I have a look down the airway. So you've got to do better than what I can see. Well, we know that when you look down an endoscope, you only get a two dimensional um, representation of a three-dimensional space, and you, you know, you're, you're, you, if you have a stereo endoscope, you're using your stereo vision to do the processing. Um, so, but how accurately we need to be able to measure a three-dimensional volume within the airway relative to a clinician is not clear. How accurate is the clinician? You, know, you need to do the studies there. Can we simply design a better instrument? I'm not sure we can, because the the, the human brain and a simple stereo vision is pretty damn good. Um, so cracking the problem, again, I come back to this question about cracking the problem. Is that the right problem to attack? I'm not sure we're gonna make a big difference to burns treatments through that avenue. Um, through the other avenue of actually monitoring treatment progression, um, you know, that that's an interesting question. I'm pretty sure that we are, I have the potential to make a difference there, um, but it's hard graft, you know, you've got to displace the uh, the what's called the Vancouver scar scale, which is you know uh, involves scoring and uh, mnemonics and things, um, with with a quantitative system which is sufficiently widely spread that clinicians learn about it on mass and take it up, and that's hard graft. That's that's long slow progress. I'm afraid. 
So yes, so sometimes these yeah. things are not a quick fix. Yeah, so um, yeah, that, that's an interesting point. I guess for optical technologies in general, there there's good scope for disease monitoring and, and assessing whether treatment needs to change and, and, and that sort of thing. But you always come up against this problem that you kind of touched on there, which is uh, you're comparing it to a scale that's kind of fuzzy and is endemic in the medical community and very difficult to to overcome. And and as physicists we can, or engineers, we come at this saying, well, we've got this really good technology that's doing this and measuring it physically correctly. And you've got these woolly parameters that, you know, everybody is guessing, you know, what is the color on a scale of one to 10? What is the edema on a scale of one to 10? What is the pain on a scale of one to 10? Um, and uh, obviously we feel our, our system is, is somehow more accurate, but of course it's more accurate from the physical <laughs> dimension world's point of view, not necessarily from the point of view of what they care about. Um, and and there, there are many facets to, you know, how you overcome that. You know, you, you, on the one hand, you have to overcome something that you feel is is wildly inferior and, and maybe even you, the part of you is thinking this is irrelevant or or, or a, a very bad system to start with. But that is the clinical gold standard. You know, and you're you're kind of stuck with that. So um, Atik Zari uh, in Enskeda wants to know: Can optical coherence microscopy be combined with laser speckle flowmetry in order to realize an imaging tool for upcoming uh, tissue three D printing technology? Wow. Uh, so I think um, one of the interesting things about speckle. Um, uh, modalities is that uh, as you improve the optical resolution, so as you improve the OCT resolution, the speckle size gets smaller. And so that comes with uh, challenges that, um, you know, in, in the case of elastography, that reduces the correlation length, which means that you can only impart a certain amount of, um, of force to the tissue, certain initial displacement without uh, losing any, uh, without losing the correlation between the speckles. Speckles quickly become decorrelated and, uh, and then you're unable to do face sensitive measurements um, without doing them in a more, much more complex step by step way. Um, so there are consequences as you move to resolution, but, um, but I think uh, the idea of doing all these measurements at higher resolution uh, is something that we should be pushing towards. And I think we need that higher resolution in areas like tissue engineering um, to be able to to really uh, be able to get the level of, of um, information that is required, which is, you know, of the order of the size of a cell. I mean, the cell, many cells are about 10 microns in diameter. You'd really like to be able to see this coarse substructures of a cell. So maybe the, nu the nucleus at five microns or two or three microns. And you want to be able to resolve that clearly in, in, in situ. Um, and so, you know, I think often when we talk about OCT systems that have 10 micron resolution, or even more, 15 micron uh, lateral resolution, which is not actually quite able to see what we need to see for the for the uh, application at hand. Um, yeah, well, wasn't clear there were, whether Atta was talking about using the same laser. Obviously, there's a conflict there. You want a very broad laser for the OCT, and typically you have a very narrow band laser for the for the laser speckle. Um, I, I can imagine that you could have a wide area with the traditional laser speckle flowmetry. In fact, you could do a whole torso of a human um, and maybe you could pick a point in that, uh, you know, this could be a screen thing. You, you pick a point and then you do your OCT microscopy at that point. Oh, I uh, see those combining those two methods. Yeah, well, I think that's entirely um, feasible to do it then with a separate system. I mean, if you use a super continuum source, you might use the pump to do the speckle flow, flow flowmetry. Um, you know, and then do the ICT with the rest. Yeah, uh, Roshan de Souza had a paper on on using uh, a dermoscope plus OCT, and a similar kind of idea, I guess, could be used for for speckle flowmetry if that was thought useful. Ben Moon from Rochester is asking: Are there practical techniques that can be used to simultaneously press, measure depth and refractive index variations, trying to mitigate the artifact that arise from measuring the optical path length, which includes both the refractive index uh, of the medium and the physical depth that we talked about. So Ben, you take me back to my early days. <laughs> <laughs> I had quite a lot of interest in measuring refractive index and we 
uh, came up with a, I actually published an optics letter called uh, Optical Coherent Refractometry. And um, I remember getting the galley proof and everything was hunky-dory and the title said Optical Coherence Refractometry. And um, blow me down if this paper then didn't come out in, in press with the E missing from the end of coherence. So I published a paper called Optical Coherent Refractometry, which um, you know <laughs> I remember to this day. Um, and, and the idea there was to actually use a bifocal confocal gate to create two humps in the OCT axial point spread function and then measure the distance between those humps by using OCT, which of course dependent upon the the, the, the average um, refractive index. And indeed, we built such a structure in a needle as well and, uh, and obtained a patent on that. But um, in essence, that gave you the average re uh, refractive index across a certain distance uh, and then gave you a physical measurement as well. So, so the short answer is yes, you can, um, but the long answer is it's bloody difficult. And uh, particularly since you need to be able to measure the refractive index to the third decimal place. You know, most of the action is not happening in, it's definitely not happening in the first decimal place. It's mostly happening in the second, third. So, you know, you really, you need measurement accuracy of, of better than 1%. And that, getting a measurement accuracy of better than 1% is always bloody hard. And so uh, I don't, I just think in general, it hasn't been achieved. Okay, uh, we are a bit over time, but there are three further questions if you're happy to take them, David. Yeah, let's uh, let's try and wrap up in the next five minutes or so, though, because otherwise people will. Um, OK, uh, Martina Kuiper from Amsterdam. What are the biggest challenges de uh, in decreasing the size of OCT systems before they can used as an on chip point of care device in the clinic? Yeah, well, yeah, I, I think uh, it's uh, it's market. You know, uh, you, you could do it, but you need to have a big enough market. You know, I come back to the mobile phone camera. You know the the feats of technology that are implemented in mobile phone cameras, uh, and you know the the feats of technology that were implemented in uh, compact disc lasers before them, uh, demonstrate what can be done. Uh, so you you can build these things on a thumbnail, but you need to actually invest in the engineering required to do that, and you then need to have a business case that warrants that. So I think that's the chicken and egg, and that is that uh, we 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 lack the volume applications, and so we have to sort of wait patiently. Um, but, you know, there are developments. I mean, there are developments in particularly in 3D printing, you know, clever optical design combined with 3D printing can mean that things can become very, very small. And even though they're not made out of, you know, zero dewar or, you know, super low thermal expansion elements, if you make something which thermally expands such that, you know, you compensate so that the thing in the middle stays in the middle, it might expand and change its dimensions, but actually you cleverly design it so that the optical axis doesn't move. Uh, then you can do that and people are just starting to I think get into that engineering cycle. So I think 3D printing will, you know, will, will make a big difference and still has a long way to go. And then making, making, oh, micro, sorry. You know, I was just say, making micro optics in that way is also something which is, is still got a way to go, um, but is very promising. Is faster image generation a possible objective of future OCT devices? Faster image generation, I think, is happening. Is still happening. Absolutely. You know, I think the uh, the new light source that was developed a few years ago by OptoRes um, came out of uh, Robert Huber's lab uh, using the FDML technology. Uh, those lasers are fantastic. You know, they operate uh, in the megahertz range, uh, whereas most other sources operate in the tens to hundreds of kilohertz A scan rates. But these these lasers can operate with megahertz A scan rates. And uh, they are becoming quieter and quieter and more and more user friendly, but they're still very expensive because there's, you know, there's one company making them and they're very bespoke. But that enables you to go faster. Ultimately, how fast you can go, of course, depends upon um, other fundamentals uh, in and around sensitivity. How much sensitivity can you get? How many photons can you get back in that time frame to be able to make a, a sufficiently sensitive measurement? So there are limits, and I think probably practical limits are going to be in the, the low numbers of megahertz. But still, that represents, in many cases, an order of magnitude increase in speed than what we can do at the moment. Okay, unless the guys tell me otherwise, this is the last question. Arsham Hamidi from Basel is asking, uh, can you comment on the possibility of using OCT for temperature measurement in tissue? 
temperature measurement. You know, I think that's really interesting. Um, you know, there are there are various things that shift with temperature, and being able to make accurate temperature measurements is a bit like trying to make accurate refractive index measurements. Very difficult. Um, you know, for example, the water absorption spectrum has a temperature dependence. And so if you were using OCT to probe uh, absorption, you're looking at an edge, that spectral edge would be shifting uh, according to temperature. Can you get uh, fine enough grained accuracy though? At the end of the day, you really, you must be able to do better than 0.1 degree for it to be useful. Um, you probably again want to be in the second decimal place if you can when it comes to the resolution that you can uh, look at temperatures with. If you can do that, then you might be able to probe metabolism in tumours or just metabolism more generally probe through temperature. Um, but it's influenced by a lot of factors. Um, I think pH is another very interesting variable. So I think accurately being able to measure these is, is a really uh, useful step forwards, but doing it accurately is really challenging. And I think this um, points to the challenges of the wearables market and that is that um, you know we've been able to, to do uh, um, you know pulse oximetry for a quarter of a century or more, um, but still there's so much artifact and so much error and systematic um, problems with the measurement that often it's unable to be deployed in, in a meaningful way. So it's understanding that measurement problem. So you could probably spend your career figuring out how to measure temperature properly. Uh, and if you do that and turn it into a, a valuable wearable, then you can make a lot of money. Um, but it's not uh, it's not low hanging fruit. Yeah, people forget that that uh, you know temperature measurements at 0.1 degree accuracy is is not that common, even on standalone devices, you know, for the atmosphere or for liquids or anything else. So people think that that's a trivial problem, but it's it's much more difficult. As we will see when people point things at us in airports and uh, heading into lecture theatres and so on, um, would be really wonderful if if this could be much more accurate. Uh, David, it's been a pleasure as always. Uh, fantastic uh, answers, much detail, uh, great experience obviously and uh, insight, uh, which I'm sure has been uh, invaluable to all of the people who have gathered to ask you questions. And as you can see by the questions asked, there was a lot of interest in your, in your topic. Uh, we can't really give you a Round of applause by this forum, but uh, they've they've shown their appreciation and and will continue to do so. I'm sure. Thank you so much. We're going to close up this session now, and uh, we will be back uh, later with Caroline, I believe, Caroline Boudot from Montreal. Thank you so much, David Sampson. Thank you very much, everyone. All Thanks. the best. I hope the rest of the school goes really well. Thank you so much. <laughs>